Good morning, early birds. This is an impressive uh, turnout for this hour. I congratulate you and I thank you for turning up uh, so promptly. Um, we're going to have uh, our uh, next version of the workshop on technology and governance, uh, the disruptive and beneficial effects of technological change, which have been dubbed the fourth industrial revolution, but that understates the case significantly. Since society had ample time in the past to develop reactions to significant economic change, but now this change arrives in digital form everywhere in the world almost at the exact same time. And societies have to react and leaders Governments have to react almost instantaneously as well. So ubiquitous and instantaneous change are upon us. They have already uh, indicated some significant problems that develop when this happens. Um, interference in elections in democratic nations is one uh, form that we Americans experienced significantly in 2016 and I think the rest of the world is beginning to experience as well. We've assembled an all-star panel to educate us all on what is happening, what is changing, and indeed, one of the questions that I think the panelists will want to deal with is what has happened in the past year that is the most significant technological change for the long run. Um, I noticed in this week's Economist, for example, that machines, computers, essentially algorithms, now hold $4.3 trillion in American securities. This is because of the automation of so much of the trading system in our stock markets, which has brought significant changes, including more efficiency and much lower cost for investors but also reduces the amount of human control over decisions that determine our economic future. So that's an example of how things change so quickly in this game. I want to first introduce Francois Barreau, who is uh, one of the leading uh, business consultants, runs his own firm, uh, and does a, a terrific job at that. Uh, Francois has been with us before and will lead us now in a discussion. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> I have two challenges this morning to wake you up or reward the early bird uh, and also to talk about very complex thing uh, in a simple manner so that you don't take your smartphone and do something else. So it's a, it's a real challenge. Um, Despite my very young age, I've been in technology since uh, 1977. I had my first computer, and not only I've been a, a witness of the evolution, but I've been an actor uh, as well. So what I want to talk about is to look, of, of course, the main technology uh, revolutions, but what does it mean for us? How do you compare a machine uh, to a human? Uh, when you look at the evolution of the technology, you have two, two businesses. The first one is, is what we call B2B, business to business. And it's quite easy because everything has been designed by the man for the machine to serve the man. So it's quite easy because you know exactly what the machine will do. B2C is not as easy because you give technology to people and you never know what they will do with it. And that's how it's difficult uh, to manage. It's like a kid, you give them toys to play, you know, in the, in, uh, in the sand, and they might uh, find themselves with, uh, with the tools or do something else. When you look at the evolution of the technology, one of the first milestones has been the arrival of the PC. I'm not talking about, you know, all the goodies, but the PC given the person an access to a gigantic world which was, is called now the cloud, but the computing. Then the smartphone came, and the smartphone was a kind of remote control 
with a cloud. And then came the very smart form, which you had a GPS location, you had also access to anything else, and the power was so huge that you could do quite anything uh, with it. So that's where it starts and when it hurts. I always compare the evolution of the computing with the body and the brain. We have a big advantage against the machine. Look at this iPhone. I can see it, I can smell it, I can taste it, not great by the way. I can also um, uh, use it, talk to it, whatever. We have five cents. We have five cents to communicate. The machine has two cents. The machine can see with a camera. The machine can listen, hello Siri and whatever. By the way, switch off your uh, personal assistant at home because everything is, is, is stored. So at least we have five to two. Now, you're listening to me right now. What does it mean? Those loudspeakers transmit the sound at 300 meters per second to a membrane here that vibrates and transmit this information to your brain. You're looking at me. The speed of light is 300,000 kilometers by seconds. Then it arrives in the optical nerves here and some of you knows me, some of you do not know me, but the combination of my voice, of the fact that you see me, will go in the brain and create in the brain a kind of memory so that the afternoon, when, if you see me, maybe you re recognize my voice or see me. Now, I have a question. I remember you that a digital fiber the data goes at 300,000 kilometers per second. When the information comes into my brain, either you see me, either uh, you listen to me, or either you touch me, what is the speed of the, the data, because it's, it's a data, goes to your brain? Give me a ballpark. You will not be ridiculous. Okay, we have 300,000 here per second. per second. Anybody more, less? Yes. Thierry. Yes. The speed of data in your brain. Ah, we have a, we have a bidder here at 400,000. <laughs> Sorry? It's an auction. <laughs> no. So I give you uh, two datas. When I touch this phone, you know, I don't break it. I held it not too tight so it doesn't fall, okay? When I touch it, I have sensors. It goes into my brain at 60 meters per second. When it's my brain, it's 100 meters per second. So, you know wh where I'm coming. We have a benchmark now between a machine that will capture the data immediately, that goes into the cloud immediately, and we have a human being where we are very slow. The advantage, we have five cents, but the machine has two, but the speed of data is, uh, is re really fast. So, what does, that, what does it mean uh, for machine? I give you an example that you will all understand. We talked about that last year, is smart cars. When you have an autonomous car uh, on the road and there is a donkey on the road, the car will look at the donkey. It takes us three iterations to recognize a donkey, the machine 400. The machine will never have enough information to recognize its donkey because the edge computing today available is not big enough. So we will capture a thermic picture. It will go in the cloud with 5Gs. Then there will be a bunch of people, like in this room, there will be a lawyer, uh, there will be a, a, a cop, there will be anthropologists, there will be a, whatever you have, and they will decide whether or not the case has been already exists or 
there, there will be a new case and say, oh, the donkey is cool, there is no car here, just cool down, and whatever uh, happens, when the, the donkey pass his way, you just accelerate. So when you look at this process, you capture the information with cameras. The best car now has 16 cameras. It goes into the cloud, 5G, next generation, at 300 kilometers per second. You have uh, as many as resources as you want, real time. They will decide, sign, give an order, and say, just break, okay? What does it mean for us? It's very easy. You see, it's a donkey. You have, you say, oh, the situation is easy, you just break. That's what we call the reflex. So, what's going on now with the fact that the technology is booming, the new Moore's law are arriving. That means new speed of communication to go in the cloud, new sensors, new quantum computing, a new algorithm that will be able to gather all the knowledge on a subject real time and decide. There will be a competition with our reflex. The reflex is about 20 um, milliseconds. You know, at the 100 meters, when the, the gun starts, you, if the, the sprinter goes before under 10 milliseconds, it's below the reflex, so it's a forward depart. So we have a competition with a machine which deal end to end in a very fast and shorter and shorter and our reflex. We can talk about augmented intelligence. I hate this uh, word artificial intelligence because it sounds fake, you know, fake news, fake everything. When the, the, the process of the data of the machine is faster than your reflex, then you can talk about intelligence. So there is a competition right now between our, the big advantage is we can correlate our sense and the machine. If I say hello to somebody in the morning, if he's tired or sick, I will see it. His voice is, is a bit cracking, I will listen to it. And then if when I shake the hand, it's wet or hot, the correlation of the strict signals captured by my sense will say, oh, you're bloody sick. The machine doesn't have all those tools, but will go always faster and faster. So we're going to see in the next three years, an incredible revolution that my friend has written in his uh, book, uh, uh, The Transhuman Code, Carlos uh, uh, Morera here, because of three technology revolutions. First of all, the new Moore's law on computing. Everything will be by million faster and cheaper and smaller. The second, the 5G, where we, you will have access everywhere where you have the spectrum. Uh, on the real time, and then all those algorithms that will create real time, um, uh, real time uh, software. Then those revolution will mostly change not our lives because we are close to uh, uh, saturation, I would say, with uh, these kind of things. But on the B two B side, and there is a new uh, circle law where technology change the usage. Usage change the business models, and business models change the investment in technology. Just one example, and then I will be done. Uh, we talk about this many times, but it's the best way to, to uh, uh, explain that. Knowledge during 20 centuries has been an asset to discriminate people. The people who knows are the people at the elite. Uh, we've seen this in Greece with the Romans, with the bourgeoisie, aristocracy. When Gutenberg wanted to socialize the knowledge, you know, he was in a bad shape. And one, one day, uh, internet came. Remember, many years ago, the boss was the one, is the one who knows. He say, oh, I have this information. I cannot tell you. So it make a difference. By the way, I have a big office with five windows. You don't. So there is lots of criteria. One day, internet came, and internet, allows with the blogs, Wikipedia, to commoditize the knowledge. That means whatever you need to know, you just go on the net, type some semantic uh, software, and you have access to all of that. What does it mean? When you share something, the young generation, you share your pictures. Look, it's 8.49. Instead of being in my bed, 
I'm a stage talking to early birds, and, and thank you for that. So you share your experience. Um, you share also your trips. You share your good, your good uh, um, experience in life. That means you, the usage change. That means tomorrow, it's okay to share your car. It's okay to share your apartment. It's, o it's okay to share your bike and whatever. So the sharing economy has started because people mentally have changed the way they deal with things. So technology changed the usage. But what does it mean for the business model? During hundreds of years, the car was a social achievement. The car was a tool where you wanted to sign your richness or your power, you want to impress your neighbors and whatever. One day, companies like BlaBlaCar, you share your cars. So what does it mean? The car is not an achievement. The car is, all of, is something you share. It's the same with um, apartments. You used to go to hotel, you share your apartments now. So what does it mean when you build cars? Are you building cars or are you transporting people? Are you hosting people or are you sharing your apartment? So technology change uh, usage, business model, <laughs> and after uh, the investment in technology. It will also imply a new set of democracies because before we were controlling the people, now people can express themselves. I could talk during hours, but you will not be happy with me. Thank you. The good news is the best is ahead of us. The machine will never take control uh, of our life as long as we reasonable. And I count on you, and I can count on my kids and their friends. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francois. I'd like to now introduce Jean-Yves Legal, president of CNS, president of the International Astronautical Federation, and chair of the Council of the European Space Agency. He clearly knows a lot about what's going on out there. OK. Thank you, uh, Jim, and uh, thank you, Francois, for your uh, very inspiring talk. I would like uh, to uh, say a few words, because you said that uh, on a smartphone you have a GPS, but now you have Galileo, because you probably remember that three, four years ago when I came here, I explained that uh, we used to say that uh, Galileo will be the European GPS, and today I can tell you we crossed uh, one billion users of Galileo, and we are in a world where when we will speak about the GPS in two years, we will say that this is the US Galileo because of the huge accuracy. This is just a point I wanted to, on, on which I wanted to insist. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, uh, it's a nice transition uh, with uh, space industry because uh, when uh, we speak about uh, the topic of today, I think that uh, space is a good example. Space industry is uh, probably one of the youngest industries, but uh, in spite of that, uh, we have to face many uh, challenges. And uh, the first one is uh, the pace of uh, technological change driving our industry. I just want to take an example. The first modern rocket lift off from Pinamende in Germany in 1942. And just 27 years later, in 1969, we are going to celebrate this human landing next week in DC with Vice President Pence. Just 27 years later, the men walked on the moon. And uh, if you put that uh, on, uh, for instance, uh, airlines, it means that uh, the first uh, Airbus A380 would have landed here in Marrakesh in 1917. It's unbelievable, because 1917. Because it would be a very short period between the first flight of uh, an aircraft and the A380. And this is exactly what happened in space. But, uh, it is just apparent because uh, this uh, apparent uh, overnight success is in fact the result of many, many years of engineering efforts. Today, a lot of people speak about SpaceX and uh, reusable launchers. But uh, SpaceX and reusable launchers rely upon the Merlin engine, which have been developed by NASA 30 years ago. And uh, if there is just a message uh, uh, taking the point of Francois on the smartphone. Today, all of us, we use a smartphone, but we have to remember that they are built of an heritage that's already more than 10 years old. This is the first point. 
Second point, it's our second launch challenge, it's the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, this fourth industrial revolution apply, of course, uh, to uh, digitalization and globalization. Digitalization, it means that the mass of satellite and the cost of access to space decrease very, very strongly. Globalization, it means that more and more people everywhere in the world have now a space program. We are moving from a situation when 10 years ago we had just 10 space agencies to a situation when we have 60 space agencies. And uh, it is clear that uh, in this uh, expanding world, access to space is becoming ever easier. And this is a point also which is very, very important. Space in the past was just for an elite. Now it is almost for everybody. The third point is what I used to call the new post truth media era. Because today, science value is no longer yardstick, but uh, we are told many, many things which are sometimes not really credible. For instance, people explain in the US at the highest level, then uh, a woman will be walking on the moon again in 2024, and a man on Mars 10 years later. I can tell you that it ends not on truth. Unfortunately, one of my colleagues from NASA said the same. He has been fired immediately. But uh, the reality is that it will take a lot of time to go back to the moon. And I don't even speak about Mars because it will be nobody knows when, even if some people explain this is for next year. But also, you see that we have these three challenges, technology, industrial revolution, and the uh, post rough media era. There is another point on which uh, I want to insist, and there will be a session dedicated to that a little bit later, is about uh, what is related to climate change. Because for climate change, space is very, very important because out of the 50 essential climate variables uh, which are defined to measure the climate, 26, which is more than half, can be observed just from space and with satellites. And France plays a leading role in this field, uh, there was uh, the Paris Agreement in uh, 2015 under the leadership of uh, uh, Laurent Fabius. We will be there later on. We have uh, the One Planet Summit of uh, President uh, Emmanuel Macron. But it is clear that it is a point which is very, very important. And to conclude, I would like just uh, to remind you, you probably saw this picture which has been taken on the 24th of December 1968 by the astronauts of uh, Apollo 8 circling the moon, and we saw from the first time an Earthrise taken from the moon. And in this image, image, we have two messages. The first one is space, it's technology, but the second one, it is the point that uh, we have the fragility of our uh, little blue dot, which is totally alone in the vastness of space. And one, uh, once again, it's uh, a major challenge we have in front of us. Merci. Now it's my pleasure uh, to introduce someone who clearly has mastered technology enough to be everywhere at the same time. That's Susan Leoto, who is professor of law and who um, balances uh, commitments at Stanford University, LSE in London, and her own business, and somehow managed to keep all of these balls in the air. Susan? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim and Shirley. Thank you for the honor. Um, what I'd like to do is to make three or four points and see what resonates for the discussion and the Q&A because that's always the, the best part at World Policy Conference. Um, and my points will have three things in common. The first is that they all have a considerable ethical responsibility for individual citizens, um, corporates, and governments. The second is that no matter how much technology is present, there are always people who are ultimately responsible and ultimately affected. And the third is that I see this intersection of technology, society, and democracy um, through the lens of risk and opportunity. So how can we maximize the opportunity? How can we minimize the risk? So to start, um, as others have said, um, technology is ubiquitous. But I think we need to reconceptualize what it means to have a society in which democracies function. Because the reality is it's no longer about individual human beings and their institutions. The connective tissue is machines, apps, and data. And to the extent that citizens don't understand how that is affecting them, influencing them, uh, what is required of their leadership in that context, 
it is very difficult um, to move democracy along with technology. So to take a concrete example of AI, um, I sit on the UK Government Center for Data and, and Ethics Innovation Board, um, which is all about AI and what regulators should be doing and what we need to tell citizens. And it's a real question about what citizens need to understand. They don't all need to be able to code, but they do need to understand about targeting and bias and that AI is everywhere from facial recognition to potentially driverless cars, but to immigration and policing and beyond. Um, so it's a very big challenge. But more generally, where technology fits in with what we expect of our leaders is critically important. Um, we have bots everywhere. We have robots taking care of the elderly. We have robots flipping burgers and greeting us at the Eurostar. What does that mean for society? Um, what does that mean for responsibility? Some of you may be aware of a robot, a humanoid robot called Sophia, um, who was created by a highly uh, ethically minded entrepreneur in Hong Kong, David Hansen. Turns out that Sophia has Saudi citizenship. Um, so one might ask, what happens to democracy when robots start uh, having citizenship? What does that mean for rights? Um, the second point I'd like to make is that we tend to think about democracies in the context of a particular country. And at the moment, obviously, there's a lot of focus on Brexit. There's a lot of focus on um, the upcoming US election. Uh, but in fact, the responsibility is borderless. And so it's very easy for me to say that I'm in no particular hurry for driverless cars and the safety promises that the entrepreneurs bring. But the World Bank came out with a statistic a couple of years ago, and this isn't going to be precise, but it's something along the lines of 50% of the world's motor vehicles are in developing countries, but 95% or 92% thereabouts of deaths from automobile accidents are in those countries. So we also need to be looking at technology through the lens of global impact, global governance, even though democracy tends to be a, a national question. The third is that we look at technology sometimes as an eraser of ill, where it provides opportunity. But in fact, it is an amplifier of age-old problems. It can be hate speech, sex trafficking, child trafficking, bullying. Right now, we are in the midst of an epidemic of teen suicides from bullying on social media. Why? Because you can't leave a playground or even change schools when you're bullied. There's just no way to get away from it on the internet. And in fact, just like citizens don't understand AI, uh, victims of this kind of thing don't really understand who might have access, where things might have been forwarded, how you could put a stop to it. So things start to seem hopeless. Similarly, child sex trafficking on the internet is tens of billions of dollars industry, to use a terrible word for it, um, and on and on. So we need to be very mindful um, when we look at how our society functions and what we expect of our leaders of the fact that technology is a terrible amplifier of these um, age-old harms. Um, and then finally, um, about voting. Uh, there are a couple things about voting. We may go to the voting booth um, influenced by foreign governments uh, infiltrating uh, our social media. We may go to the voting booth having been targeted through algorithms uh, with advertising and indeed just generally a victim of some algorithmic infiltration of our freedom of thought. Um, and we may also have uh, security issues around the voting process itself. There are people like Brad Smith at Microsoft uh, who are talking about uh, experimenting with different uh, voting machines to fix that. Things like a combination of screens where we choose our candidates on a screen, but there's actually, believe it or not, a paper trail, one that could be audited and paper receipts that have tracking to algorithms that would allow us to track. Um, but whatever the technology that influences us and whatever the technology is that we use to vote, again, people are here. And when we look at the statistics, for example, the last US presidential election of somewhere in the mid 50% turnout, no matter what we do with technology, no matter what we experience, if we don't go vote, uh, democracy is going to be in jeopardy. And then uh, finally, truth. I've spent a lot of time the last couple of years um, thinking about truth in my ethics advisory work and in particular with corporate, large corporate clients. Um, compromise truth or the assault on truth whatever you want to call it, whether it's fake news or deep fakes, uh, whether it's ignoring scientific evidence 
or whether it's cherry picking your favorite facts so that you can get the outcome that you wish and no, you're not inconvenienced by the facts that don't work for you. Uh, I genuinely believe that compromised truth is uh, the greatest global systemic risk of our time. It undergirds every other challenge we have from climate change to global governance failure to political system issues to financial system meltdown. And democracy hinges and our society, our trust in institutions, our trust in each other hinge on truth. So to the extent uh, and, and accountability of our leaders hinges on truth. So to the extent we don't have truth, to the extent that technology can amplify uh, fake news, that it can amplify compromised truth, uh, it is a threat to democracy. I genuinely do not believe that an alternatively factual democracy is possible. And I think I'll end there and welcome the conversation. Thank you, Susan. Thank, thank you for your contribution to keeping us on time. I'm sure Holder May will join you in that. Uh, Holder May has a title that most of us would kill for in our organizations. He is the Vice President for Advanced Concepts at Airbus. Advance us, Holder. <laughs> thank you. Well, some walk, some sit, I stand. So um, <clears throat> I want to talk about two points, basically and illustrate them a little bit. One is society and the interrelationship relationship of um, high tech, in particular artificial intelligence with society and then with the economy and the digitalization of economy. So um, <clears throat> the first point is, of course, um, the relationship of uh, freedom and security as it is related to surveillance and control, which we all experience happens every day and all the time more and more. Now, freedom and security is not a trade-off relationship, as it's often being put. You have total security, no freedom, or total freedom, no security. I think without a certain degree of security, we probably have no freedom and cannot enjoy any freedom. The freedom of the people in the World Trade Center was to either jump out of the window or get burned, and that's, of course, not the freedom we mean. Um, there are sometimes, in some um, countries uh, after sunset, two groups of people in the streets, criminals and victims. And uh, that's also not uh, the um, freedom we want. So we have to look into the question of how we structure and organize all our societies, be it China, be it the West, whatever, in this relationship of security and freedom. Now, I want you to imagine 5 p.m. rush hour in Paris, Washington, or any big city, and you walk through the streets. What do you see? Almost every intersection is blocked because people drive into the intersection although they cannot pass. It is because they are unattentive or just selfish and ruthless, whatever, but it doesn't work. Now, you have the autonomous car and the artificial intelligence-based traffic control system, and you can easily imagine that this problem will be solved. There will be a smooth flow of traffic and it, and it works. So far so good, until a person, a pedestrian, steps onto the street. Now the car will stop. What does this person learn? Hey, I can walk onto the street whenever I want and all traffic stops. So we will experience a complete breakdown of traffic because of the behavior of people. Now, there are two ways to deal with it. Either you program the car in a way that it once in a while overruns the pedestrians and they learn to pay attention, or you have video surveillance anyway, everywhere, and there is, um, of course, biometric data recognition, and you step onto the street and then you will read on your mobile device, well, we just deducted 1,000 euros from your account. If you do that again, it will be 5,000. If you do it once more, you will be in prison for one month. So we learn to behave, right? Now, the individual in the past was doing a crime or a terror act, whatever. It was a very regional, probably only local event. But with the empowerment of people, in particular with modern technology, be it, be it biological weapons, be it cyber weapons, be it misbehavior in a, in a society, in a in a structure and an environment which is networked, you have cascading effects. So the impact will be significant, and now it's about the relationship between the individual and the collective. And I think it doesn't take much imagination that China has a clear idea 
about the relationship between collective and individual as we have, and it's probably a little bit different, but it's important to talk about it and to understand that no matter what society, we have to have to talk about this relationship and how we balance individual and collective. Now, I have argued that security is a prerequisite for freedom. This is, is clear in the social, I mean, if you have hunger, you don't ask for freedom of press, as we have heard from Marxists before, but this also applies to the security in the streets. Now, how does a collective protect against individuals who misbehave? And how to protect the individual, of course. Now, I think we should start thinking about something which my friend Parakana argued so nicely. We need probably to adapt all our societies to that in a way to think about a combination of Switzerland and Singapore. Switzerland, because you did discuss locally about fundamental issues, important issues, values, and Singapore because you have the very best technocrats working in the government. And, you know, I think we have to creatively think about it because only the combination will probably do it. Now, um, the economy. We all know the answer is digitalization, but what was the question? It is, I think, about turning art into science at the moment. It is engineering art, not science. It's the art of war. It's um, the art of cooking. Now, if you go to a restaurant with a, a three-star Michelin chef and he cooks a wonderful dish and he gives you the recipe, you have the recipe in your hands and you go back to the kitchen and cook the same thing, exactly what is written on paper, it will be a nice dish, but not as good as the dish from the three-star Michelin cook, the chef. Why is this so? Because documentation is never complete and there is something which has to do with feeling, experience, whatever. So you read there is, take a little bit of salt, but what is a little bit? Now, if this is digitalized, it is a precise number. We call it production data. If you have the production data, you know how to do it precisely and exactly as the three-star Michelin cook. So how can Germany in the future export Audi, Mercedes, BMW, Porsche, if everybody, at least most of the countries, can produce the car in exactly the same quality because it is based on a digitalized production where you have the production data at some stage. Steal it, buy it, you know, have spies, whatever. Um, the problem is how can we make sure that we stay ahead in a sense and the interesting thing that invention only helps very shortly because if you're an artist, a sculptress, and you make a nice sculpture, if you put it into the 3D printer, you have two million originals. It's not distinguishable anymore. So Germany invented the Telefax, but Japan produced the Telefaxes and marketed it and made the money. Even if you are like in China for a long time, just a copycat economy, you make money not by just inventing things, you make it by doing the application and sell it, sell it. So the problem is that we are challenged with innovation and high quality manufacturing as we move into the digitalization, which is of course without alternative, but nevertheless, it will be a big, big challenge. Now I think um, the problem with the intelligence in this whole part is I'm not so much concerned about artificial intelligence, I'm more concerned about human stupidity. The question how we use this. And I think if we think it through, it's not about intelligence per se. That doesn't necessarily do us any good as we see with many modern autocrats and, and dictators in history, they were not necessarily stupid. But it is related to a civilization, to culture, to values, to the question of reason and reasoning. And that is something where we might still have a certain competitive advantage to very intelligent machines. As I argued two years ago here at the same place, that um, referring to Ray Kurzweil, who wrote an article about 20 years ago, and the title was so wonderful. The title was, The Computers Will Convince Us That We Are Superfluous. 
And if we don't one day end up in a zoo and little robot babies make fun of us, we better start thinking about our own role as human beings and how we use artificial, so-called artificial intelligence for the good, which is related to culture and civilizations. I think we need this debate in all of our societies. We call our, our different societies. We'll deal with this challenge differently. Thank you very much for your attention. Our final speaker for the morning is John Sawyers, whom I first knew a long time ago as the very well-informed Deputy Chief of Mission of uh, Britain in Washington. And a few years after that, I was surprised to learn that he'd become head of MI6. <laughs> John today has a very important business consultancy, and he's going to tell us all about everything we need to know. <laughs> thank you, Jim, and thank you very much for inviting me back to uh, the World Policy Conference. Um, it's very hard to build on the, uh, the vari wide variety of thoughts we've had from the first four panelists, but I want to put it into a global strategic uh, context, because um, <clears throat> there's absolutely no doubt that as we move towards, uh, or rather back to, a world of great power rivalry, where the institutions that we built up in the uh, period after the Second World War are basically in decline and are being replaced by competition between great powers, almost a 19th century world, with the United States and China being by far the, the, the biggest two, um, and Russia, Europe, um, uh, India, uh, being and Japan being players as well. In this great power rivalry, technology is playing a central role. Let me just focus initially on the rivalry between the United States and China. The United States has some historical advantages here. It has the biggest corporates, uh, like the, uh, the ones we all know, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Netflix, uh, uh, Google, and so on. Uh, but China is catching up quite fast, uh, not just in China, but beyond China's borders as well. But the United States has a lead in corporate development. Um, uh, secondly, the United States... Uh, dominates the operating systems uh, through Microsoft, through the Android system, through Apple. The United States is definitely well ahead and has global reach for, its, uh, for the operating systems of the IT that we all use. Um, and thirdly, the United States has a, a, an iron grip at the moment on the semiconductor industry and the intellectual property that is associated with producing uh, semiconductors. So that's where the United States is ahead. Where China is ahead is first of all on the Internet of Things. Uh, China, uh, it's estimated, will be producing about 95% of, uh, of the elements that go into the Internet of Things, uh, all those computer devices in our, uh, in our homes and in our, in our businesses, uh, that will hold that uh, together. Uh, China is also ahead in telecoms network infrastructure, and I will come back to that, the uh, arguments over Huawei and ZTE. Um, and uh, uh, there's a question as to whether China uh, is ahead of the United States on machine learning, what others call artificial intelligence, uh, but there's no doubt that the China is making a huge state-led research uh, investment in machine learning, <coughs> uh, perhaps drawing on what President Putin famously said a few years ago, that the nation that uh, dominates machine learning will control the world. <coughs> So that's the sort of the competition at the moment. Let me just focus briefly on, on the telecoms network infrastructure because the, uh, the argument about Huawei and ZTE in intelligence circles, I, I became chief of MI6 in 2009, and we had a big split in the Five Eyes, uh, United States, Canada, Britain, Australia, and New Zealand, between those countries that accepted uh, we have the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister of, Aus of Australia here. He was familiar with these arguments. Uh, there are those countries that refuse to allow Chinese telecoms equipment into their national systems. Uh, and there are those like the uh, UK and Canada uh, that um, accepted some degree of uh, presence of Huawei equipment under very strict controls. And these arguments have been running for 10 years or so. But what's become now is, is what's happened recently is Huawei and ZTE have become part of the argument between China and the United States for dominance in technology generally. Um, I don't think the intelligence argument is a new one. Uh, what is new 
is that the, uh, with the advent of 5G telecom systems, um, uh, if you rely solely upon Chinese manufacturers, uh, then you are going to be uh, in serious jeopardy uh, of having your systems uh, subject to control by China. Now, that's true if you have your entire system, and India, for example, will, will rely entirely on, on uh, Chinese equipment for its uh, 4 and 5G systems. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean you have to go to the other end of the spectrum and have zero uh, equipment from China in your systems, and this is where the argument lies. Uh, but the United States is not only pursuing an intelligence argument here, it's pursuing an industrial policy argument. The United States, through a series of, um, of, uh, 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 of steps over the last 20 years, has found itself without a, a national champion in telecoms network infrastructure. And I think President Trump is trying to re-establish the United States as a player in the telecoms, uh, telecoms world. Um, and it's, I think, a bargaining chip also in this wider US-China uh, trade relationship. So that's on, that's on the telecoms side. On defense, there have been some very interesting developments recently. As this rivalry between the United States and China hots up, both capitals have to think about what if the worst happens? We have, to, we have to plan ahead to the possibility of an armed conflict between the United States and China. Now, the, the Chinese are developing very sophisticated systems but are heavily dependent upon the US in certain areas, for example, semiconductor provision. But the United States isn't safe either because so many components of US defense systems are made in China. And what we're seeing is a move both in Beijing and in Washington to decouple their defense industries so that they are not dependent upon the other country just in case the worst comes to the worst uh, and the two countries end up, uh, end up in conflict. Now, um, uh, I think what is happening in the defense field is happening more widely as well, but it's, it's, it's sharpest and most prominent in the defense field. We have moved past peak globalization. The scale of globalization that we saw developing the 90s and 2000s has peaked and is probably now in decline as, as both the United States and China seek to decouple their, um, their economies from one another, primarily for defense but also for industrial, uh, industrial purposes. In the security world, we're seeing China develop an extraordinarily sophisticated surveillance system of its own population. Um, uh, one advantage the Chinese have is they're not particularly concerned about human rights and they have no concept of data privacy. Uh, in the world there are uh, sort of three concepts of data. In Europe it's controlled by the individual, in America it's controlled by the corporate, in China it's by, controlled by the state. And that means that the state, of, uh, in China the state have got um, almost unlimited use of your data to control and to know where you are. Now, some of them, is, is the, the sort of um, uh, scenarios that Holger was, uh, was describing, of um, if you go to Beijing and you step off a payment and there's a red light, then two days later you get a letter from the, uh, from the authorities saying you were seen jaywalking, crossing, a, uh, a, uh, a crossing when you shouldn't have done so, and here's a fine. But of course, they don't use it to control people on the pavements. What they do is use it to monitor potential dissidents. Uh, and China now has a surveillance system that Joseph Stalin would have died for. It is more effective, it is more thorough, uh, and it's less violent uh, and more accepted by the, by the population. Uh, so in the world of uh, surveillance and control, China is no doubt far ahead of, uh, of all other countries uh, in, in this realm. And then lastly, just a couple of words on cyber. Uh, cyber, of course, is um, the means by which uh, uh, countries and, and corporates and criminals can hack into um, uh, uh, other people's systems, either to cause damage or to steal intellectual property um, uh, uh, or to hold you to ransom. Um, uh, we all know the cyber world, we all know uh, how cyber defences have improved, uh, but cyber attack capabilities have also improved. Um, in this area, I think the, the major powers are very conscious of their own vulnerabilities. 
uh, in the West, we are conscious that our entire systems are based on uh, IT networks that, um, uh, 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 that uh, uh, shape our daily lives. And if our IT systems were brought down, our banking system, our public health care systems and so on, then the scale of damage to our, uh, uh, to, to our stability would be great. It's even more the case in autocratic countries like China and Russia, um, where they feel themselves very vulnerable to um, exploitation, to uh, uh, the stirring up of unrest in their countries, and we're seeing a progressive move by autocratic countries to take control of their uh, internet space um, uh, so that they cannot be subject to disruptive cyber attacks. Um, uh, uh, we saw earlier this year Russia experimenting with cutting their internet off from the rest of the world. Uh, this was seen as an emergency step that they might need to take in a crisis. Well, I think it will be surprising if Russia develops the capability to cut itself off from the rest of the world and then doesn't use it as the norm, as the status quo. And where Russia is leading in this field, China is also taking a very close interest. And of course, there are other countries, Iran being an obvious example, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is um, uh, taking a, a close interest in... in uh, 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 in having control over its own domestic internet uh, uh, and separate from the global internet in the same way that they want to de-dollarize their, their economies, they want to uh, reduce their dependence on the, uh, the US-led uh, infrastructure system. So I think in all those areas, uh, whether it's just straight industrial competition, whether it's the dominance of the machine learning space, whether it's for defense competition, and of course this is spreading into, in defense, it's spreading into the mergers and acquisitions world where every entity, whether it's the European Union uh, or Japan, as well as the United States, is, in, is giving themselves greater powers to scrutinize uh, control of technology uh, takeovers. Um, uh, uh, whether it's in the cyber world, this, the, the, the role of technology uh, is central to the great power rivalry, uh, which is going to be the, the, the design model of the world of the coming decade or two. Thank you. John, John thank you very much for sobering us up. Um, we clearly need it in uh, terms of what we think about, how excited we get about technology. Uh, I'd now like to take some questions from the audience. If you would, give us your name. And if you have any particular association that would be important for us to know, for example, if you uh, have a question for Holger about Airbus and you happen to be working for Boeing, Boeing please tell us that. Um, and I'll start right here. I'm Mathilde Pack. I'm an economist at the OECD working on the Korea Sweden desk. I have a question for Mr. Barreau regarding uh, his comment on the, uh, the knowledge availability on internet. Completely agree with you. I mean, when I compare uh, my very first uh, presentation and when I was a young student and right now, I mean, there's a big, a big gap. But this requires to have the digi digital skills. And for that, we have a big gap between the young generation and the elderly. Uh, in the case of Korea, which is a really high technology society, you have uh, the young generation which has almost no problem of basic skills, why the elderly do. So what would you suggest so that the whole population can benefit, make the most of uh, technology changes, while also be aware of the dangers that M Mrs. Liuto uh, raised? Uh, what would you recommend? And I know that in that matter, we all will often uh, recommend lifelong learning. And in that case, how should it be done? Should, be, should the government centralize uh, and uh, take care of lifelong learning? Or should it be taken care of the level of firms? And if so, how would firms get the right incentive to promote this life learning? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> it's a very uh, good and interesting question. Uh, one of the obsession right now re regarding uh, the proliferation of data is what I call digital inclusion. Uh, as you remember, when a few years ago you have access to uh, limited data, now it's huge and huge. Data without correlation or no meanings has zero effect. 
Now technology can help as well. Um, imagine you are on vacation um, with uh, 25 people in a big, uh, big home in the south of France, and every morning you, you, uh, you have a, a room full of socks, uh, pants, trousers, and whatever. Those are the data, okay? If somebody who has no knowledge how to put things together in a house, like me as an example, I will be totally lost. Now the new algorithm will put information together, socks with socks, with age, with family and whatever. So um, the, the, the next generation algorithm, algorithm are creating correlation with data you know, that means sense to the person. Uh, think about you know, the, uh, all the clothes um, uh, in a room. And all, most of the leaders in the digital technology have again an obsession uh, which is to make data relevant to people or, or to some or to, uh, or to uh, communities, and the next generation uh, algorithm uh, does that. There is a huge effort right now in countries, cities, to bring technology to people, because before you had to go to technology, uh, and I'm very confident that it will help the older generation to have access to this uh, fantastic uh, uh, tool. Well said, Francois. The next hand I saw was over here. Wait for the mic, please. So, my name is Stanislas Cozon, Capgemini. Question to you, Holger. Uh, I was intrigued by this question of security versus freedom. And the example you gave of crossing roads and automatic, automat autonomous vehicles and the behavior of people, I thought this is a profound situation. I mean, it's, it's telling. And my question to you would be, what is the role of education in helping people learn how to behave as free citizens in our civilization, in the new world of new technologies? Well, education is, of course, the key. And I wish everybody would be well educated, has good manners, behave nicely. But of course, human beings often don't. And, and this is the question, how then we deal with those who don't. Because, you know, we usually say, well, at, for instance, at the end of the day, um, the computers need to be controlled by the human being. I say, by Mr. Hitler, by Mr. Stalin, by Mr. Mao, by Mr. Pol Pot. No, no, only by good guys. But, but who's that? Who defines that? That's, that's the problem. And of course, if we say, well, this is something, uh, you know, how human beings should, should inter interact. Well, if you look at the social structure of, of street gangs in Los Angeles or Mexico City, you would see this is a different behavior than we all have here. So yes, education, it would be great if this works and if we have only good people, you know, so to speak, but um, there, are, there are bad guys out there for whatever reason and we have to somehow deal with this or with people who misbehave and all that. And a state that comes up with the rules but doesn't care about rule enforcement or law enforcement, undermines um, the respect for law, which is a problem. And I want you know, the local communities, if you wish, to discuss, well, should we have a speed limit of 30 kilometers per hour in front of a school? And if the people say, by huge majority, yes, that's a good idea to protect our children, then I don't want people to speed there. So either you may pink, come up with a rule there and then you have radar checks and you make sure the people behave or you don't care and undermine the whole respect for law. I wish everybody would respect 30 anyway, but we know how few people do if you don't have checks. Susan, you had a one finger. Uh... No, I just wanted to address this um, very important question as well. There's a lot that we don't know about behavior. So for example, if you have a bot babysitter, is it okay to be insulting in front of your child to the bot? I mean, after all, it's a machine. Are we gonna be educating children to be disrespectful to Siri or Amazon Alexa, even though we tell them that they should be respectful to adults? So these blurred boundaries of behavior with machines are quite complicated. Um, and you know, as was just said, uh, who, who gets to decide in terms of the programming of these machines? There was a, an incident many of you may have seen a couple of years ago with a Microsoft bot called Tay that was put out a bit too early and started spouting incredibly racist and anti-Semitic uh, remarks. And Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, promptly uh, you know, withdrew Tay and, and fixed the problem. 
Um, but the reality is that many stakeholders have a say in behavior these days in ways that are unprecedented, and I think we need to watch that very carefully. Well, how scary is that? We now have about 15 minutes left, so I encourage both speakers and the questioners in the audience to be very succinct. We'll come down here. The next hand I saw was here. Monsieur Laïchoubi, ancien ministre, politologue, je voudrais suggérer euh, l'élargissement du spectre du, du débat avec une question essentielle de rapport euh, entre science et éthique. Nous avons eu deux grandes phases. La première phase avec Newton, Laplace, Maxwell, se chauffer, se soigner, euh, voyager, communiquer. Puis les années 30, on a eu euh, les, une poussée exponentielle des technologies avec euh, des dérives, le plutonium, Bhopal, euh, le sang contaminé, Tchernobyl, des grandes désillusions. Et puis, on peut additionner, vous l'avez évoqué, les grandes compétitions géopolitiques, où les uns et les autres considèrent que les nouvelles technologies leur assurent la, la, la prééminence. 61 euh, académies des sciences européennes, réunies à la commémoration des 350 euh, années de l'Académie des sciences euh, françaises, ont estimé qu'il y a une, un risque de rupture entre la science et la, et la société. Alors, euh, la question, bien sûr, c'est, on revient à la question de l'éthique, à quelle stratégie de recherche, quand on sait que les Japonais ont décidé d'inverser totalement leur recherche, de la mettre à la disposition du besoin social. Alors, est-ce que nous sommes tous concernés par euh, certains types, un angle géopolitique euh, exacerbée, est-ce que cela nous concerne la suprématie d'un tel sur l'autre Est-ce que l'humanité n'a pas besoin de notre débat Merci. François, would you take a crack at that? Euh, je vais répondre en français à monsieur le ministre. En fait, j'en ai un petit peu parlé, dans le type de, de projet technologique, il y a deux types de progrès. Il y a le progrès encadré, vous avez cité toutes les révolutions industrielles avec d'ailleurs des, des cycles de Schumpeter euh, très très longs. Et en fait, on a euh, la science cadrée, a mis en place un process, un framework euh, qui permettait euh, de faire progresser l'humanité. Et puis un jour, Internet est arrivé, le smartphone, etc. Et on a transféré cette puissance de feu à l'individu. Euh, et je l'ai dit déjà hier euh, plusieurs fois euh, à la conférence, Internet a été la plus grosse révolution industrielle en termes de création de valeur sans aucune gouvernance. Au début, Internet était euh, un outil de communication entre A et B, les universités, et devenu euh, un outil de communication entre des personnes. Euh, les SMS, on refait juste un peu d'histoire, au début c'était un 911, c'est-à-dire un, un numéro d'urgence de, 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 au Japon, qui a été détourné par les adolescents japonais qui sont très timides et ils ont utilisé donc ces, 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 il y avait 300 caractères à faire une sorte de, de, de jeu de séduction, etc. Et là où, où le bas blesse, où là c'est à la fois inquiétant et fascinant, c'est que quand vous donnez un outil à des individus où vous le contrôlez, débrouillez-vous, vous ne savez pas où ça va. On a eu le printemps arabe, on a eu les gilets jaunes qui sont des nouvelles formes de démocratie je ne discute pas le, le bien ou le, le, le bien fondé, mais euh, ça a complètement échappé au système organisé régalien qui encadre. Donc, euh, par rapport à ce que vous, ce que vous dites, c'est qu'il y a une ambivalence, c'est-à-dire que soit on continue à cadrer le progrès, ce qui a toujours été fait dans les machines, soit on donne aux, aux, aux citoyens des outils pour qu'ils se développent, communiquent, et là, finalement, on ne sait pas comment ça va, puisqu'il n'y a pas de gouvernance Internet. Hein. Euh, que vous gagnez 100 millions de dollars sur une transaction, vous demandez l'heure, il n'y a pas de... On ne réinjecte pas la création, la création de valeur euh, là-dedans. C'est pour ça qu'il y a des dérives, absolument, euh, et qu'il convient de les encadrer, mais chaque fois qu'on va encadrer quelque chose qui ne l'a pas été, on va nous traiter de rétrograde ou de, de personnes euh, conservateurs. John Sawyers has a chip shot on this. Yeah, um, I just wanted to... Uh, come in on this point because I, I didn't mention much about the Euro Europe's role on, on this. There is certainly some very interesting and important technology development taking place in Europe. 
although we are falling behind both the United States and China in terms of both um, uh, 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 basic research and how we exploit that at the corporate level. But I think the European Union has an important um, regulatory role here. I, I, I implied a reference to the um, uh, 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 general uh, data privacy, GDPR, uh, regulation that Europe pushed through a couple of years ago, which is now a global standard. Uh, uh, we're seeing now the work of the European Commission on the taxation of global corporates in the technology sector. And I think this will also become a global standard, even though Washington is kicking and screaming uh, about it. Um, the, uh, there is a certain role here in terms of regulating this rather wild world where Europe can play a role, but we, I think in order to have that influence, we will also need to invest more um, uh, in basic research and building up our corporates in order in enabling the, uh, the uh, uh, areas where Europe does have an edge, and aerospace and, uh, and so on is certainly one of those, um, uh, uh, in the years to come. So, it, the, the, in many ways, the biggest challenge that regulators will face over the coming generation is how we transfer the rule of law we have in the physical world into the virtual world. And I think there's an important leadership role that Europe can take in this. Kicking and screaming is the order of the day in Washington now, John. Johnny, if you had a brief, brief remark. Yes, but I agree because uh, when uh, we hear that uh, the US and China are the first and that Europe is behind them, I don't agree because uh, there are numerous fields where uh, Europe is number one and uh, what is uh, really uh, of interest is that uh, we have uh, less money, it's obvious, and uh, we have also uh, real uh, capability to organize and to cooperate because uh, when Europe works uh, in Brussels or in other intergovernmental agencies, you have uh, 20, 25 countries working together. And uh, in my opinion, it's a real asset of Europe. Afterwards, for instance, in space, uh, when uh, I see my uh, China counterpart, he tells me, how many are you in CNES? I answer uh, 2,500. He laughs and uh, I ask him, uh, how many are you in China? 110,000. But okay, we are 60, 67 million in France and 1.6 billion in China. But in spite of that, uh, on many fields, we are at the same position as that in China. And so we don't have to be shy because uh, Europe is today uh, at the front side in uh, research and technology. I have a series of uh, hands in the front row. Uh, just add one point, please. Yes, please. Um, I mean, of course, uh, Russia sometimes is geopolitically uh, a difficult partner to handle for Europe, but the true competitors are indeed China and the US, of course. But you know that Europe can do something. You see, if I may, with my own company. In the 60s, nobody would have believed that Airbus could ever compete with Boeing and see where we are now. So if Europe wants to get its act together, it can do so. Okay. Go to Carl Kaiser in the front row. And we'll stay in the front row for the next two questions. Carl Kaiser, Harvard Kennedy School. I have a question for John Sorgis. John, toward the end, you seem to suggest there's a difference between autocratic regimes and democracies when it comes to cyber threats. Democracies, they, for example, their, cap, their, their banking sector can collapse or their grid, whereas in autocratic systems, the regime is at a, ch at a, a threat. But couldn't you also argue that democracies also have a regime problem? Some could argue that Putin put their man into the White House, mm. destabilizing the United States, indeed the Western liberal order. So democracies are also threatened as regimes through cyber. Is there any difference here? Well, I, I, I think there is a difference because there are more checks and balances uh, in uh, democratic systems than there are in autocratic systems. Um, I think one of uh, the uh, 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 driving concerns of President Putin is that the Russian system has totally collapsed twice in recent historical memory, in 1917 and in 1991. Uh, and the reason he's so fearful of things like the, uh, the, the colored revolutions and what happened in Ukraine in, in uh, 2014 um, is that he fears uh, a, a third collapse of the Russian system and will do everything he can to prevent it, and so far quite, uh, quite skillfully uh, and ruthlessly. Um, I think in the West, 
we do have more checks and balances than that. And the, um, uh, uh, the American system and the British system in different ways are both going through uh, a populist moment, a period of crisis, but our fundamental structures of the system are not, uh, are not in jeopardy. We're not about to collapse as a society. And one of the reassuring aspects, of, we'll talk about Trump on a panel tomorrow, um, uh, one of the reassuring aspects about America's response to a, uh, a character like Donald Trump in the White House is that the system, by and large, is holding up, um, uh, despite, the, uh, despite the strains and the, and the cracks within it. I mean, I, I, I do think it's interesting that uh, the most aggressive users of cyber in a state-to-state -state level have been countries like um, uh, uh, Russia against the former Soviet Union countries, uh, Israel against Iran, and Iran in retaliation, uh, and to some extent North Korea as a way of sort of trying to get some money, some rent seeking out of the international system. Um, it's, it's striking that uh, although China has used cyber very extensively for um, intellectual property theft, um, uh, and of course there was a famous uh, uh, stealing of the uh, Office of Personnel Management records in the United States, the, the using it as a weapon of war both China and the United States and European powers have been very reserved about how you use that because, in part, because of the threat of retaliation um, and vulnerability, which I think, as I say, all powers face. But I think I would still say autocratic countries have that much extra vulnerability because they don't have any checks and balances. They basically don't have uh, broad systems of consent, uh, so the stakes are even higher for autocracies than they are for democracies. John, in uh, this phase, the system is not only standing up in Washington, it is fighting back. But about, more about that tomorrow. Right. I saw a prime ministerial hand down here. No? All right. Um, yes. It's, uh, Daniel Dayan of the Romanian Central Bank. Um, checks and balances they are essential for democracies, and, and we see quite clearly. It's not only that it wasn't the case of Nixon now in, in, the, in this case. But let me ask you, checks and balances are not sufficient. If, if the political establishment is estranged from the ordinary citizen, okay, then uh, we, we, we get into trouble, and this is a big, big issue in the liberal democracies. Now, secondly, it seems like, and, 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 and you, you have not alluded to, but it's clearly that we are moving into a block-based uh, global global system. I shouldn't call it a system. It's not a system, and, and this is this is very unnerving. What kind of an order? Geopolitics, security concerns, clearly, the U.S. versus China, but <laughs> there are global public goods which have to be provided. Uh, it's about climate change, dealing with machines. Some of them may be turned into very obnoxious beings. So there should be a global order. And, and what should be done? What should be done? At the end of the day, it may have, the United States may have to strike a deal with China. I mean, it's <laughs> however, let's say, unpalatably look like. I'm asking you because you... Well, it, it, I, I'm not sure this has much to do with the topic of the panel. Uh, we can talk about this in other sessions. I just make two points. Um, uh, first of all, the populist moment that Europe, continental Europe, uh, Britain and America is currently going through is partly a correction of elites having become out of touch with ordinary sentiment. It's a violent correction and it's having some very unwelcome uh, consequences, not least for my country, um, but uh, uh, nonetheless, there is a sense of um, uh, ordinary citizens reasserting themselves, uh, and and uh, uh, the conventional leaderships of the elite are having to make uh, corrections, uh, both in terms of uh, wealth distribution, in terms of power, in terms of responding to the concerns of people who feel excluded. Uh, from democracies, and that's what we're seeing now. It's painful, and some of it is very negative, but nonetheless, I think that's basically what's happening. At a global level, I entirely agree uh, with you that we need some global commons. We need some 
a means to develop global public goods. Um, uh, and that's, that was the triumph of the post-1945 world, was that under American leadership, with strong European support, uh, we created a system which did deliver on that. It is now um, in really struggling, and I think your reference to climate change is exactly right. The capacity to address climate change problems um, uh, uh, has sharply reduced because the United States and China, in separate ways, have both distanced themselves uh, from, uh, from the Paris goals and are, are, now, are going in their own direction. We, we will have to rebuild this. I'm frankly not optimistic that things are going to change uh, in a year's time, but we will, uh, we will discuss that tomorrow. I have just gotten the hook from Pierre de Montbrial, meaning we're out of time, and I dare not risk his wrath. So we will wind up here with thanks to you, uh, a very well-informed and uh, timely audience. Thanks so much, and to the panel. Thank you.